Hello, I'm Bryony Worthington and this is Cleaning Up. My guest this week is Solitaire Townsend, co-founder and chief solutionist at Futera. Solly and her team have been helping clients be more sustainable long before it became mainstream. She's a self-made business leader, an entrepreneur, author, problem solver and brilliant communicator, though be warned sometimes at warp speed. Naturally upbeat and energetic, I knew speaking to Solly would be an energising and thought-provoking start to the year. Please join me in welcoming Solitaire Townsend to Cleaning Up. Before we start, if you're enjoying Cleaning Up, please make sure that you like, subscribe and leave a review. That really helps other people to find us. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe to us on YouTube or your favourite podcast platform and follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn or Instagram to participate in the discussion. Also, you can visit cleaningup.live to access over 160 hours of conversations with extraordinary climate leaders. And you can subscribe there to our free newsletter. That's cleaningup.live. Cleaningup.live. And if you particularly enjoy an episode, please spread the word, tell your friends and colleagues about it. Cleaning Up is brought to you by our lead supporter, Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, and the Gillardini Foundation. Solly, it's so good to have you here. And I just wanted to kick off this conversation with the obvious question, which is, in your own words, could you introduce yourself? Tell us what you do and why. Lovely. Thank you so much, Bryony. And it's lovely to be here. So my name is Solitaire. I always have to say that first because it's an unusual name. If people hear Solly, they'll think Sally. Um, and I am the co-founder and chief solutionist at an organisation called Futera. And Futera is about making the Anthropocene awesome. Um, and we might want to dig into that a little bit more. I'm also the author of a couple of books, the most recent one of which is called The Solutionists, which is all about basically becoming the leader that the world needs, which feels pretty relevant to uh, this wonderful podcast. Oh, well, thank you so much. And so, Solly, you, you've had a, an incredible uh, life that's led you to this point. And yeah, I mean, perhaps we could just start with Futera. So like that 2001, this is something you launched. And that kind of tell us a little bit more about what led you to that, 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 that kind of moment where you broke out and started your own company. So um, <laughs> it's actually a bit of a story about luck and timing, as of course these things always tend to be. So uh, I have an arts background um, and I uh, have master's degrees in uh, Shakespeare and in sustainable development, which uh, tells you that I have wide ranging interests and was a very boring young woman. <laughs> I wanted to do a lot of study. And after the, doing the Master's in Sustainable Development, I was really struck by how everybody that I worked with in the arts, everybody that I worked with in marketing, everybody that I grew up with, hadn't heard of this incredibly important thing of sustainable development. And I was like sort of, you know, bright eyed with, in, you know, as if I was a recent convert. And I just wanted to tell everybody about it. And I started working in sustainability and I was so passionate about it. And I was boring everybody at parties who'd say, hey, what do you do? And it's like, I work in sustainable development. And then their eyes would, would close over. And so um, uh, with some colleagues, um, received some funding. Um, the National Endowment for Science, Technology and the Arts in the UK gave some funding to us when we were sort of in our mid-20s to look into this issue around communicating sustainability and actually what there was in it. And we started a project. So Futera was a project. And within a couple of months of that project, people started coming and saying, oh, actually, could you come in and do some sessions for us on what you found? Or could you come and facilitate this thing? And so we started to do some paid work through a previous com- company that, um, that I'd set up. And then within about a year and a half, we realised, ah, oh, I've fallen into a niche. <laughs> People spend hours, weeks, months, years trying to find a business niche. I literally tripped and fell into one um, and realised that Futella wasn't a project. It was a calling. It was what I wanted to do with my life. Um, and so started building a business around what was already quite a successful and, and moving idea. Um, and over the years, it sort of changed and developed and evolved as, of course, it must um, if you want to keep doing the work that's going to make a difference. But that core at the center of being there is an answer to all these big awful challenging scary problems and there's this amazing set of answers out there and I just want to tell the world about them has remained sort of the heart of what we do 
And so, so just to help us understand then a sort of day in the life of Futera, you have clients who come to you with a range of challenges, but they're nearly always in the sort of communications and narrative space. Is that correct? So, yeah. Not, not it... just. So over the years, what we've developed into is um, what we call a change agency, um, which does logic and magic. So the logic, the solutions work that we do is actually um, pretty kind of hardcore sustainability. So uh, doing carbon footprinting, doing human rights strategies. Um, we helped work through Formula One, committing to go net zero and in fact, no longer use petrol in Formula One cars. We've done a lot of work on Google sustainability strategies. And that's what we call that's what we call the logic. And one of the reasons why we do that is because often people come to us to do comms and they're not ready. <laughs> they don't have anything to communicate. And so actually we got drawn into doing some very, very depth work. And we tend to do quite a lot of work on the edge. So on the what's next, a lot of what we call future scaping and getting strategies ready for the future. And then the other side is the magic. And the magic is the storytelling and the communications, the human truths and the engagement. Now that used to be a lot of work for corporates on things like sort of, you know, cause calm and purpose but actually we're moving much more now into storytelling industries working with entertainment industries working with social media creators in actually trying to get sustainability sustainable solutions climate justice into what you see on your screens be they on your little screen where you're engaging with social media creators and influencers or on your big screens where you're watching broadcast media and one of your kind of insights in this journey through Futera has been that people respond to stories, right? That, that, that the logic part is only, as you say, a part of it. The, the, the magic is what kind of gets you out to an audience. And one of the things I've always found in the times that I've spent talking to you is that you, you speak like a human. You know, you understand human, human motivations. And um, what do you think in your background gives you that sort of, uh, it's like, it's a kind of super skill of being able to take something that's quite technical, but then make it relatable would you say that's what you do that's enormously kind of you to say and it thank you because um i can wheel out the geekoid if i have to you know i can throw my ppms around and my sort of crsfds and uh, albedo effects and all of their sort of uh, uh technical scientific jargon but i tend to find it's not very useful and they're speaking to fellow geekoids um and you know you know a little bit about my background and uh, you know this very plum uh, British accent is is fake. Um, I actually grew up in social housing in the UK um, with an accent that very much tagged me in what is still to this day a very class based system as as somebody from a very poor background and um, the people that I grew up with, my family, my friends, my contemporaries as I, as I was growing as I was growing up, there's a certain distrust of elites and of education, etc. And so as I became one of those, and I am could not be more sort of plummy, elite, educated now than I am, I always have retained this desire to still be able to to talk in a way that people around me would understand. And the people who are around me are not always people who have got master's degrees coming out of their ears and and you know the kind of background where you just sort of naturally learn about this stuff and I'm a real proponent of the fact that to change everything is going to take everyone really genuinely is going to take everyone and these solutions these answers these exciting things which we, which we're working on in sustainability everybody deserves to be part of that and the best way to do that is to communicate well now there's communicating well in a really kind of open inclusive normal way talking like a normal human being there's also inclusive in terms of language and uh you know shocking you know how few of the most important scientific documents are translated into anything other than english for example so it's also about making sure that our, our stories are, are authentic and real but also accessible by the most number of people and, and do you think this has got even more critical now? Because so when I started out, well, perhaps just started around about the same time as you, maybe um, there was a lot that could be done by elites in in a way. You know, you you could sort of tinker with the electricity system and and put in some good policies, and then suddenly the power coming out of your wall was no longer brown; it was green, and that was sort of an invisible transition to for many. Um, I mean, we had problems with acceptability of wind farms, etc., which did so it still needed good comms, right? But now the, we're getting to the phase, certainly in the UK, where 
we're asking people to adopt new technologies into their lives that you know technologies they're actually quite fond of like their car or their boiler or their way they cook their their food for dinner um so do, do you think this has become ever more critical it's, you know we need to talk to everyone uh, as opposed to just an elite I, I I believe it always has been. I actually think that it's a mistake to think that we can create a sustainable future only by working with experts. The experts are necessary. Of course, we have to have people of expertise. Some of this stuff is really complicated. You know, I don't want to try to replumb an energy system or work out how to build a wind farm or, or uh, think about how we're going to change our tax system. It's like I really want people who know that stuff in depth to be able to do it. But one of the things which is often forgotten in our movement is that we tend to be working within permission economies where actually you require that permission, that mandate for change, not just in what you're asking people to do within their own homes, but within the politics of the countries within which we live. And we've all lived through the last several years of upsets and unexpected changes in, in politics that showed us that the ways we thought things happened might not be the case and that our nice solid expectations of how things are going to work to totally turn out to be wrong. So if you think about powerful people, the corridors of power, the CEOs, the political leaders, of course they need to be engaged in, to understand this. Um, but they're not going to move without people power. At the other end. So if we've got the powerful people, you need the people power in order to create that durable majority for change, that durable majority for change over time. And that's hard and it's difficult, but it is not impossible. And I think if we could get our story right and actually um, uh, tell the whole story of what we're trying to do with sustainability rather than just part of it, which is what tends to happen, is one part of sustainability that's get told a lot and there's other parts of it that don't get told at all. And this one of the reasons why we use the word story a lot, story, 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 is because of the shocking thing about human nature is that human beings believe stories more than we believe facts. We believe evidence over anecdotes. And you know this word. I, um, I once stood on the stage with the, you know, the wonderful Johan Rockström, one of our you know, leading global scientists, a dear friend. And I said this, the science tells us that people believe stories over facts. And he was like, oh, no, 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 I can't believe that. And I was like, Johan, don't be a story denier. <laughs> it's as bad as being a climate denier. This is, this is just how we're programmed. And when you think about it, so... Imagine you want to buy a new car and you do all your research. You said hours online, Googling, you know, parts per, miles per hour and effectiveness and safety stats and like, you know, reviews, etc. And you've really made a very informed decision that you're going to buy a particular EV. And it's something which you that you really feel confident. Then the next day you're in work and you're standing by the water cooler and a colleague who you don't even like very much, you tell them about this and they say, oh, no. Oh, you don't want to buy that car. My brother's cousin. Oh, the maintenance costs on it. The maintenance costs on it. Oh, you wouldn't want to. They don't tell you that. All the evidence would show you won't buy the car. Just because one, one anecdote from someone you don't even like will actually affect your confidence about your own executive functioning, your own logic decision making. And that's why it's so important for us to tell real stories, true stories, authentic stories. But to but but we have to start doing that rather than beating people over the head with the facts because you know we've been doing that for twenty years and it's not got us where we need to be. Yeah, and and to you know your one of the things I think is wonderful is that you've got this very positive solution oriented mindset, right? And you've written a book called The Solutionist, and we'll come on to that. But but I, sometimes the thing that I I find hard is that whilst we're all trying to do this, get to this win win win, and you know this nirvana that we can just see is over the horizon. Um, there are quite a lot of people who are telling stories on the other side, right? There is a, it's not a level playing field. There's quite a lot of stories being seeded, being placed, you know, misinformation is a big thing. And I, I just wondered, you know, I know you are usually a very optimistic person and therefore I'm sure you've thought this through and come up with a positive spin on it. But how, 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 how do we acknowledge the fact that we're not in a, it's not a, it's not a blank sheet of paper. There's an active set of narratives being seeded that are probably better resourced and a bit more disciplined than we are. And what 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 do you, what's your thinking around that? Much better resourced and much more disciplined. The you know the 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 fossil fuel industry. You know what was the recent one? Um, a hundred million, just that, and that was one from Shell. One one brief that Shell gave. You know, ramp that up and ramp that up. We are literally 
fighting billions of dollars being spent on some of the best communicators in the world. Um, one of the big things which I do is do a lot of work with social media creators on TikTok and YouTube and, and, uh, and Instagram, etc. There's a huge amount of money being poured into that sector to get those creators to talk positively about the fossil fuel companies. So absolutely, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I'm an optimist. I'm not blind. <laughs> it's like there is, there is, there is a huge amount of work going on. I find that encouraging in one way because it shows how very, very scared they are of us mm -hmm. in terms of the fact that they know we have a better story. Our story is better because it's true. So just automatically, we have a much, much, much better story. Um, uh, that's one of the things which makes me optimistic. Our story is much, much, much better. Um, I'm also really optimistic because we've been telling that story so badly. <laughs> we're telling it so badly. And yet we've managed to get to where we are in terms of public understanding, in terms of political action, in terms of there having been some really big movements, in terms of where we are on renewables. Um, we have managed to get so far in terms of actually this 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 change, this this flip we've got to do in our economies with really terrible storytelling on on in the main. It's wonderful, fantastic pockets of excellence in terms of engaging people, but overall, it's, it's not been brilliant. So just imagine what we could do if we actually started to tell a better story. And we don't need the billions. So, you know, I'm, if anyone wants to cut a check for several billion for me to do proper climate communications, I'm not going to say no. But we will win that story war because our story is true um, and because our story is better. We just actually have to start fighting it. Mm, and and so I mean, you recently gave a TED talk, which I thought was awesome. I think it's had lots of views, like over a million views. So you tapped into something and you describe the role of the, of the sort of, and there's a kind of group of companies, right? The, the marketers, the advertisers, the PR people who, well, you tell you tell the story. So, so you know, what 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 can can that industry do? What do you want that industry to do? So the professional services industry um, uh, and the advertising industry and marketing industry within it, we're talking about a two trillion dollar industry. Now, this is a massive, massive part of our economy. It's also the part of the economy which m many of the most creative and insightful people go and work for, because. Some of the best storytellers in the world find out that they can't make a living being a writer or an artist. You know, not everyone can be a, a novelist or, 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 or you know, um, a creative. And so they go to the only place where you can make a living if you're a creative person, which is the advertising and marketing industry. So these are people with really, you know, great skills, but also deep gifts in terms of, um, they're very gifted people in terms of storytelling. Um, and the one of the biggest industries that use that that those gifts that one of the people who pay for it the most is the fossil fuel industries and so what we've got is we've got this situation of um the people who we need most to be working on the solutions the people who have absolutely got the storytelling ability the the ability to influence the ability to excite what i call the industry of influence it's huge a huge industry of advertising agencies, marketing companies, research companies, media buyers, huge, huge, huge industry. Um, and their skills are being used to prop up the current status quo. Now, we're in a position at the moment where a lot of people who work in that industry increasingly are unhappy about that. You know, they actually didn't go into advertising to flog more crap to more people or to help burnish an oil company's reputation they went in it because they love creativity and they want to tell great stories and so we're beginning to find a pushback within that industry we're also beginning to find a pushback on that industry so you've got some fantastic work that's being done to try to ban fossil fuel advertising people go well, you know you can't ban fossil fuel it's like well we ban cigarette advertising when we don't allow um, uh, fast food to be advertised to children we don't advertise pornography there's lots of legal industries that we haven't banned as industries but which we don't think there's any reason for them to advertise and one of the reasons why that's working one of the reasons why there's actually likely to be a whole set of ad bans that come out over the next few years is because of the bad practice it's because of the greenwash it's because of the case after case after case so you know that industry is a really important industry and um there's some very bad practice that happens within it there's a great deal of greenwash it's a very murky industry in 
in terms of knowing who works for who and who pays who. But there was beginning to be a little bit of light shine in a few corners. Um, there's wonderful projects um, such as the work done by Purpose Disruptors looking into advertised emissions and like, well, you know, if you're if you're helping a company to sell products, how much carbon is that how much extra carbon is those extra products going to be that's advertised emissions and clean creatives and work with clean creatives where basically some of these amazing creative people just promise that they're not going to work on fossil fuel um uh, advertising um agencies even making those promises so there really there really is some progress i had a weird little, little intersection with this when i was uh, working in philanthropy and around um uh, cop 26 we were trying to work out how to um, to, to, to advertise, right? To, to almost partly to block anyone else taking the space. Uh, we, we worked with a group of creatives and we had ads placed with NGOs. And But what was fascinating for me was it's so multi-layered and there's so many kind of sacred cows and norms that are quite kind of a little bit offline, right? A little bit misaligned. So we tried to get some ads placed at airports and um, they were very, very strict that we couldn't put any any advertising up that caused distress, right? So we can't, we couldn't make any of the customers passing through feel any kind of anxiety, right? And then I stopped, but, I, but then I think what, what, well, I always feel anxious walking through airports because you're bombarded with luxury items and affordability, things that people can't really afford, right? You know, but you're being sold this very glamorous, aspirational, high consumption lifestyle as you walk through. And um, I thought, well, that's causing me anxiety and discomfort. Like, so, so what's your definition of, of what's acceptable, that what messages can be told to people at certain times? And I just thought the whole thing is geared towards a certain assumption that, you know, as long as you're just getting people to conform and buy stuff, it's fine. But anything that deviates off that is somehow not allowed. Oh, very, very much so. And there's, um, you know, I, I, I get it. Lots of people have anxious fires. They don't want people to, to have their anxiety raised before they, um, before they go through. You know, there's, um, there's even kind of actual mainstream ads, sort of perfume ads and lipstick ads you can't show in airports because, you know, they, they show people looking anxious. Um, but you're absolutely right. The, the horrible anxiety of having to walk through duty free before you even get to like, plus the anxiety of going, have I made the right decision? Like, can I make a carbon case for this? flight should I be doing this at all like I, I think long and hard every time that I fly um and never entirely sure whether I've made the right decision or not made the right decision and I tend to get literally as I'm walking onto the plane tend to get this deep sense of anxiety not least because I'm very very scared of flying <laughs> so I'm really scared of flying so actually I, I have a carbon case but also a sort of self-preservation case of going why am I doing this um and so yeah like I think the um the definitions around advertising are very out of date, but that is changing. The EU have got a whole load of new rules which are coming out about greenwash with really genuine, um, uh, serious consequences, not just slaps on the wrist, but sort of 5% of operating profit have been um, uh, banded around as being. Um, next year, um, the FTC in the US are going to come out with a new green claims code with, again, much tighter rules around greenwash. So it is it is catching up um, uh, the, the, the rules the the definitions the 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 boundaries around what you can advertise and this sense that actually there is some types of advertising that that isn't appropriate such as fossil fuel advertising now people go but they've got the right to talk about their product it's like think about the adverts that you've seen from the fossil fuel industry how often were they saying hey come onto our forecourt because our gas is cheaper Almost never. Almost all of the advertising you've seen is actually um, what I would call lobbyizing rather than advertising. It's lobbying for the fact that it's a valuable, important, contributive industry. It's basically talking about themselves as a company or talking about their industry, not talking about their product. I actually would be relatively fine with um, adverts from oil companies saying our gas is $5 cheaper or 5% cheaper than it was. That is advertising. I'm not okay with them touting everything which they're doing on renewable energy when overall the industry worldwide is only investing 2% of its capital expenditure on renewables. Yeah, I mean, you've touched on something pretty huge there, which is that it's not really uh, a market, right? That, that it's an oligopoly of players who really don't compete on price at the forecourt. And most of their profits made way upstream and they run everything, you know, so, and it's not unregulated, right? So, so whereas most essential services, we've realized that 
we need some sort of regulation, price regulation. The upstream, well, the whole of the oil and gas supply network, the, gas, the oil particularly, is un, unregulated. There's no price controls. So we're left with this kind of, um, you know, we're price takers and there's, there's, there is no benefit to them of really advertising their product because it's an essential service. And then the irony is if it's an essential service, then should there be some price regulation? Yeah. <laughs> but, this, but this is what's so interesting because this is an intensely powerful industry, very, very powerful industry. And it's not even an industry. It's also li literally countries, <laughs> whole nations. Um, you know, we have the, the ISCs, the international oil companies, but we've got the NOx, the national oil companies, which are, which are um, based sort of in the Middle East and South America, etc. It's a very, very, very powerful industry, which is why we have this legacy of them not being regulated. But they're not as powerful as they used to be. So if you go back, you know, 30 years, 35 years, and you look at the most valuable companies in the world, almost all of them are either oil and gas or completely dependent upon oil and gas. They were oil and gas or they were plastics um, uh, or, or they were um, uh, commodities based on oil and gas. So we like the most valuable industries in the world. They don't even break the top 10 now. The, two, the most valuable companies in the world are all tech companies. Um, and, you know, tech has a very, very, very big carbon footprint, but it's a really easy to decarbonize footprint. When I think about a data center and you think about a massive data center, which is a huge energy suck in a very small geographical space that doesn't move around, could not be easier to plug renewables into. But if you wanted something to decarbonize a big energy user, what geographical space is perfect. So actually, the most valuable companies in the world are some of the most easy to decarbonize which many of them are doing so actually i think we're going to find over time that the omnipresence and the absolute influence and power of that oil and gas industry is going to wane um, in comparison to others and it does put an obligation on other companies the ones who are now the holders of the power and the influence to step up yeah and actually say sort of stand up well, because, you know, you've, you've touched on something there, which is, yes, there's been a, a changing of the guard at the top, <clears throat> but those companies are now mostly driven by advertising. Mm -hmm. and, and so they are part of your influence sector and they have a kind of, apart from carbon footprint, they have a kind of brain print or I, you, you use, a, I think you use that phrase, or there's a, there's a sort of, um, th th they have so much power now over how people consume news, how people consume information. That that you know, had we had we used that more effectively to wake people up to climate change, would would that not have been a more important thing to do than so the, worrying the, about data centers? So this is where I can get super geeky. I love this conversation. So absolutely, kind of web one, web two, web three. I'm sure you might have heard this terminology. So web one, web two, and web three. We're currently in web two, which is where most of the value generated by the new technologies, particularly the communications and information technologies, are based on advertising. Not all of them. Take, for example, the gaming industry, a huge industry, um, far, 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 but the gaming industry far, far, far larger than the coal industry in the US, for example. Um, that isn't based on on advertising that's there's a product there that people um feel is valuable to them and they are prepared to pay for access to games so that is a huge part a huge parts of the entertainment industry are no longer based on advertising almost all of the entertainment industry was based on advertising or on government funding now you've got streaming services where we're beginning to pay so you're beginning to see almost a sort of a de-advertising model that's coming across a lot of the tech companies but when you think about things like amazon amazon basically is a retailer it's a mechanism for us to buy more stuff and many of the other platforms are based on that they're, they're, they're but we don't pay to use them we are the product, as people say, our, our, our data and our communications. But Web3, which is, a, which is a new format for the internet that's coming within the next five years. It's not imminent, but it is soon. Web3, the, the programmers who are working on that, is all about creating value within the internet, within the virtual world, creating value that doesn't have a material impact. And it's fascinating because you talk to them and they're all super, super excited about dematerializing value and the fact that actually, you know, very inspired by the gaming industry, the value will be within the system and won't have a footprint. And none of them have really clocked the fact that that has a huge sustainability impact. As of having really fun conversations with some people in Web3 now about the fact that going, you do realize that what you're proposing is a massive, mass decarbonization of our economies and that web three could be absolutely transformational and you just see them going huh 
I just thought it was cool. <laughs> so it's, it's a really party. interesting conversation. Yeah, but I mean, just to be a bit cynical about this, um, this this is, I guess, likely, though, to be subject to the same economic actors and forces. Like, for example, um, Shell just realised that they could promote cars and driving of cars through Fortnite, right? So, so yes, everyone's living a new life in Fortnite and, and, and merrily entertained, and that's the attention economy. But it, it's it's always you know, those with the most money who can exploit that the first. So, so you're sort of seeing, I, I worry that it will, yeah, I, I'm a little bit less utopian possibly about this, this, I mean, but am I misinterpreting what you're saying? I, it's, no, I th that's, that's a very web two. So that's, that's, you know, obviously that's advertising again. And I would be very, very interested to know whether them, prom them, promoting driving through Fortnite has increased the likelihood that people who use Fortnite will drive more. So um, uh, you, you may find that that was also lobbyizing rather than yeah, advertising. No, sure was, and in fact, that was more about talking about Shell as an industry. Um, uh, one of the things which we are increasingly aware of is that driving, take dri driving is a perfect example of something that's changed in our lifetimes. So for my generation, driving was freedom. Driving was, um, having access to car was how you got to your friends, how you got to entertainment, how you got to fun. It was how you actually had a life. Was it like if you couldn't drive, if you couldn't access the world, then you were stuck in your little village or your hometown and couldn't get out. Um, a mobile phone, you know, my phone is a better car. It's much better than a car at doing that. I get entertainment. I get I get friendship. I get connection. I get um, uh, I get you know dating all through the phone rather than through the car. And it's one of the reasons why we've, we're seeing a significant drop in the number of seventeen year olds in the US who get their driving licenses. Now that's terrifying for a certain number of industries because having a car, getting a driving license used to be literally the rite of passage to adulthood. And now young people are going, no, driving is like being trapped. I can't be online whilst I drive. There's literally laws that say I can't use my phone whilst I drive. And so you're beginning to see not just less driving from young people, but a disinclination to even learn to drive because their online life gives them access. Now, let's be clear, I'm not utopian, I'm optimistic, there's a difference. Utopian would be, wouldn't this be a wonderful world to live in? I actually don't think it would be. I think there would be stresses, anxieties, the online life can be very atomizing, you can get very um, uh, uh, the very loneliness in the online life. It's very, there's lots of concerns about how do we try to make that Web3 equitable, um, accessible, something where there's value shared between value creators, etc. All I'm saying is it would be dematerialized. And so there is a there is a big opportunity and potential there. Um, there's also massive, massive, massive threats. What I sometimes worry about our movement is that we can be a bit Luddite and sort of going, oh, that all sounds awful. And just talk about it all sounding awful. Well, I'm going, well get in there then. How are we going to work with Web3? This is coming. Like, we don't get any choice about it. This is literally, there's about 10 different programs that are currently competing with each other for which one's going to be Web3. It's unquestionably happening. So how can we get in there now and say, right, this is going to happen. How can we build in some sustainability principles to it before it launches, rather than what tends to happen is about 10 years after something becomes a reality, we suddenly go, oh, that's not very sustainable. Let's see if we can um, retrofit some sustainability into it. Yeah, I mean, I guess, yeah, I mean, then that brings us back, though, to the to the, the, the sort of real challenge of decarbonizing the electricity system, right? Because, you know, the, one, one of the things we've seen through humanity is we've gone through these epochs of, of using of energy to improve our lives. And, you know, we've made breakthroughs through fire and then into largely a wood and uh, wood based economy into fossil economy. And now we're sort of entering into this age of electricity and hopefully abundant electricity. But but for that to work, we need to see actual projects, physical things happen. People need to get jobs in engineering, pour money into concrete and, 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 and basically, you know, build out an energy system, which <clears throat> will, will require a lot of capital and a lot of, I, I suppose, the, the storytelling about how we sustain our lives is a little bit hidden. And it, we, we take a lot of things for granted. And, and I kind of agree with you about the, the slight Luddism in, in our movement because it, it sort of takes for granted what we have and, and, and then moans about the bad aspects. But then when it comes to the actual 
change that's needed. Like we're going to have to put a lot more stuff in a lot more places. Um, that then there's a sort of, you know, you find green groups who on the one hand will be anti-fossil and on the other hand, they'll be anti-wind farms or anti, anti anything that's not what we exactly have today. So I, I find that quite challenging. The story, the story is quite challenging. You know, a, a, a hobs, um, cooking hobs are a good example of, you know, I, I grew up thinking that I grew up with electric hops because that's what people, poor people had. And then as I um, did well and I sort of got my first gas hob, I was super, super excited. And, you know, this was going to make all my cooking so much better. It turned out it didn't make my cooking any better. Basically, you're a good cook or you're a bad cook and the hob has nothing to do with it. <laughs> No, I'm just a bad cook. Um, but then, of course, the more I learned about it, and as I got into to climate change more, I started feeling like I had this open exhaust in my home. Like I just could it's like I'm literally setting fire to a fossil fuel in my home. Oh my God, that's actually, it's actually when you think about it, you know, it started to feel like I was choking in my house every time that I turned it on. And so now I'm back back to an electric hob, and it's a very glamorous, gorgeous one, and, and what have you, and it and it my cooking is and improved or unproved but it's very much the same um in terms of the story we actually spend quite a lot of our time telling the story of technology or telling the story of finance or telling the story of infrastructure none of those are stories <laughs> stories are always about people they're always about people. Stories are always about emotion. Even if people say, oh, well, there's lots of stories about animals. It's like, yes, there are always stories about anthropomorphized animals and we tell a story of their emotional journey. <laughs> it's That's what human being stories are about. And actually stories are deeply programmed into us. We teach our children through stories before we even start to teach them any ed any formal education. We tell them fairy stories and parables before they can talk. Um, it's so 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 programmed into them. There's um, term, you know, homo narrativa, the storytelling ape. That, that actually stories are so innate to what it is to be a human that it's one of the defining characteristics of us versus other animals. And so we, have, the story we have to tell is actually a story about emotions. So when people ask me what's what's my vision of a sustainable future. I don't say wind turbines or sort of small houses or local community gardens, what have you. So my vision of sustainable future is that, you know, I can sleep better at night. My vision of sustainable future is that I've lost a couple of pounds and that my I feel a bit healthier. My vision of sustainable future is that I get more time in my day and that I'm not so rushed off my feet and I'm not having to sit in a commute. All of my vision of a sustainable future is how it will be emotionally better to be in that sustainable future, how I will get more sleep, be less stressed, less anxious all the time, have more time to myself, feel more connected, feel a real sense of belonging, be less isolated, all the things which people actually want. And what you find when you tell that story is you get very little pushback on it. You get pushback when you, when you tell the technology or the infrastructure story. You don't get pushback when you tell the emotional story. And then, of course, you talk about well, how do we get those things? And then you talk about the fact that actually having sort of 15 minute cities and having um, uh, services close by mean that I won't have to sit on a, my ass on a bus or a car for hours. So I'll get more time in my day. And then people will believe you and agree with the infrastructure or the finance or the technology you're selling because you've sold the emotion first. Mm. That's what we get. That's what we want. We want the emotional benefits, not the technical ones. And yet I find so much anxiety in our movement for talking about that because we've sort of been, been backed into this corner of sort of going, you know, we must be always fact-based. It's like actually emotions are a truth. It's a truth. Like people feel them. That that there's there's not that's not somehow a soft cell. That is actually one of the most important and accurate cells is how people are going to feel. And so when we think about these changes that we want to make, when we think about this um, this overhaul that we need to make quite significantly to our economies, to our buildings, to how our systems work, to how our economies work, um, talking about the emotional benefits, how you're going to feel when that's done much, much, much more likely to generate support than talking about the technologies or the policies. And do, do you think, um, do you think the, the, the emotion towards something positive is more powerful than the avoidance of fear? Like if we, or, or, or trying to not feel negative, because um, let's just take food, for example, this is going to be one of those massively controversial areas where we're going to need all of our storytelling powers to try and make the shift into more sustainable food, right? Um, 
and it but it, if we get it wrong the risk of backlash is so huge people don't generally want to be told what to do by the government trusted actors are you know that, that are premium but there's not so many of them around as there used to be um how, what's our way into a conversation about sustainable food but when, when the perception i imagine at the moment is that you know rich people can afford to be organic and eat all these lovely pet you know pulses and whatever else that's good for the planet whereas i you know i can literally afford to go to kfc and get that thing you know that that i'm or actually kfc is not as bad it's it's the beef burgers really isn't it but but how how do we broach this is it is it through uh more positive you, you'll be healthier and and hopefully finding ways of making it more affordable um or is it like actually we're doing a great harm animal welfare is like a touch point for lots of people that, that perhaps just as a bigger consciousness, if we could move to a point where we're, we're doing less harm to sentient animals, is that valid or, or yeah? I think it's valid for some people. And I think mm -hmm. it's, I think almost everybody that that's valid for has been reached with that message. When we think over the period of time, because that information is widely available, when we think over the, over the previous, and I go into this in my book, in The Solutionists, I actually look very much at what has turned the dial on plant-based. There's been sort of, you know, outrageous movies that sort of go, you know, go into the, the horrors of what mass farming looks like and what some of these mega farms and what happens to the animals within these mega farms, standing up their knees in their own waist, just awful, awful, awful stuff. And that did turn the dial. It did turn the dial, but it didn't, um, uh, reach sort of velocity in terms of change. What reached velocity during, ch during change, the most important piece of communication about changing food that there has been in the last 10 years was the Game Changers programme. It's a Game Changers programme about plant-based eating, which was almost entirely about the benefits to you as an individual and not the health benefits in terms of some sort of wonderful wishy-washy, I want to be healthier, I want to, I want to have lower cholesterol, like, you know, the number one thing I should be worried about is cholesterol, health in terms of looking big and muscly or looking thin and attractive, which when most people say health, that's actually what we mean. When we say I want to be healthier, what we tend to mean is actually I want to be thin and fitter rather than healthier. It's not, you know, if we want to say healthier, what to say is, you know, I want lower cholesterol. <laughs> Whereas actually, we say is we want to look healthier. And so Game Changers, which, you know, went into cage fighters and bodybuilders and how they use plant-based foods because there was more calorie availability and that um, you were able to, you know, they went into all the science of why it's going to actually help you bulk up, um, how plant-based help bulk up, really changed the dial. And you started to see folks from a whole load of different demographics and different interest areas you started to see this being a real kind of um, conversation based in gym based culture um, in, in well-being culture in fitness and and in thinness culture as well and that's what really accelerated the whole plant-based movement that we're part of right now mm. sustainability didn't and animal welfare didn't neither of those things were fundamental in forwarding the plant-based movement, which which had, has grown so big and, you know, is currently having a, a bit of a flat up because we haven't had a game changers for a while. Mm -hmm. And then right. we need another programme like that. Because right. that's the, the thing, it's got to be sustained, right? You can't just... It's, it's got to be sustained and it's got to be about what's in it for you. Most people are collectivist at heart and do wish the very, very best for everybody else. But most people are struggling. One of the things which I think is sometimes forgotten by those of us who are in extremely uh, privileged uh, positions where we're lucky that so many of our basic needs and so many of our anxieties, you know, most of my anxieties are about big things like climate change rather than am I going to make rent? Mm -hmm. um, and we forget that there is the vast majority of people, there's far, far, far more people, far more people who are in personal concerning circumstances where although they might wish well to the whole rest of humanity and the planet and, and, and other animals, they'll get to that when they've made rent. They'll get to that when they've dealt with their current illness. They'll get to that when their immediate concerns and worries about themselves and their families are met. And so when we when we sit down and look at these big changes that need to be made for sustainability, these big architectural changes that need to be made for life on earth to continue... Almost all of them come with major personal benefits. I mean, really, really big benefits for you, for you personally. Not anybody else, not the rest of life on earth, but for you. But most of the sustainability movement don't like telling that story because they don't think we should be that selfish. 
They, they think we should take action and care and agree and vote and eat and change for the sake of the rest of life on Earth. And with very little understanding of the monumental privilege that perce perception comes from. That, you know, the, the, the privilege of being collectivist in your mindset is huge. And for most of the rest of the world, they need to have something in it for them because their needs aren't met. So we ha and, and again, we could be asking for something. We could be trying to change things that actually were worse for people. That would be really problematic. It's not. With this wonderful situation of almost every single major infrastructure change, major economic change, major lifestyle change, we need to ask of people, come with major individual benefits, major things which are in it for them. And yet, very, very rarely is that ever, ever communicated. Do it for the planet. Do it for your kids. Do it for future generations. Do it for everybody else. Do it for the poor people. Why not do it for you? Again, um, I'm, I am more than happy to communicate on that basis because I know that that's what would have convinced me when I was living a lifestyle when, when I didn't have the bandwidth to try to save the world because I was literally trying to save myself and my family. That kind of message would have convinced me. So I have no problem <laughs> telling that story. Excellent. And um, just talking about you, you again and your agency and the fact that you do things like you're extraordinary at... Um, seeing a problem, not just thinking of a solution, but then committing to try and bring that solution to life. And I wanted to ask you about your experiences in actually bringing a product from your mind out into the market. So tell us about Lovebug and how that <laughs> happened. Well, this is this is a perfect example of, um, I really like cats. I'm such a cat person, you know, grew up with cats, um, absolutely love cats. And as I became more aware of sustainability, as I did my research, I was like, God, they're an environmental disaster. All pets are kind of in terms of yes, pets might eat the offcuts or the scrapings. So speak of the main of the of the main meat industry. The main in, meat industry is far too large and is an unsustainable industry itself. Which means pet food is it's is an unsustainable offcut of an unsustainable industry. I was like, mm, but I really like cats and the sacrifice thing of of going well. You know, having pets is unsustainable. I was like, I'm not sure I'm okay with that. And so started looking to would there be a way to feed a cat sustainably? Now, you can actually have a perfectly healthy vegetarian dog. You've got to put a lot of effort in and you've got to really plan it, but you can have it because dogs are omnivores, so they can get all of the um, nutrients that they need without animal products. You can't with a cat. They're one of the very small number of animals that are obligate carnivores, like spiders and sharks. They have to eat um, other animals in order to get some basic amino acids that they, their bodies can't produce otherwise. Um, and so I looked into insects. An insect protein, very high quality protein, hyperallergenic for most cats. Um, actually, so such a good quality protein, you have to mix it with some vegetables because otherwise the cats actually get too much protein in too short a period of time. And so um, I bought that to some friends at Mars Pet Care, one of the biggest pet care companies in the world. And then we spent years, literally a decade, working together in order to develop Lovebug, Pet food, 100% insect-based pet food um, in terms of the in terms of the animal products within it, in 100% recyclable packaging. Which it turned out a lot of consumers were more excited about than the insects, because it was the first 100% recyclable packaging on the market. Um, that took about three years. <laughs> um, one of the one of the people we worked with at Mars, bless her, she took home about 10 different bags of cat food over sort of a long holiday period and left them around her house to check how much they smelled. <laughs> if they've stored them in different ways absolutely so much dedication i didn't do that so much dedication to the job um and then we were able to to bring it to market um wonderful commitment from consumers was sort of named the pet food launch of the year and you know, it's now actually going into dog food and into kitten food and all the rest of it so that's that's my and i again i go into that in much more detail in solutionists but that's that's my theory of change i think too often we give up but that's unsustainable you know, well, then what would be what would meet the same need in a sustainable way if we if we want to have cats how do we work out how to have sustainable cats and the next thing i want to work on is how to get cats to stop killing birds so that's my next challenge um but if we if we want to have if we want to have something in our life that matters to us that value that it brings with an emotional benefit and i believe pets are really good for us having pets in our home i think makes us better people how do we find a way of making that sustainable rather than either ignoring it or dismissing it to something which can't be sustained. Um, and yeah, that just takes a little bit of lateral thinking and an enormous amount of work. 
And but but here, what was the relationship with Mars Petka? Like, why is it your company and not Mars doing it? What's the sort of so what what you tend to find in very large companies is they are extremely good at growing businesses. They go out and they acquire companies. They acquire companies that have gone from sort of like no no consumers to sort of, you know, 10, 20,000 consumers. And then, you know, they've worked out all the kinks. They've got everything sorted. And then the company, a big company acquires them and then takes them global. What most large companies aren't very good at doing is like being really entrepreneurial. Like in the first first kind of weeks of Love Bug, I knew every consumer by name. We phoned the first 300 of them, said, hi, what do you think? Are you enjoying it? That sort of piece. Um, it, it, being really adaptable, being really quick. And so actually what we agreed with, um, with Mars, like Mars were basically waiting for somebody else to do that so they could go and buy the company. What we said was, let's do it together. You manufacture the product because you know how to make cat food and make sure it's safe and make sure it's good for cats. I don't know how to do that. We'll, we'll, we'll package it, we'll brand it, we'll market it, we'll sell it direct to consumers. And then when it goes over a certain size, it can go back in house and then you can take it. But we'll do all the messy, scary, quick entrepreneurial stuff where you literally sit there on Shopify watching every bag get sold um, without having to go through all the socialization and thousand meetings and up and down the chain and waiting four weeks for somebody to say yes to something, which is how things work in big companies. Mm -hmm. And so actually Lovebug now, we, although we, we still do the marketing, the comms, but Lovebug now actually is inside Mars. So it it reached the critical mass and it's now inside Mars and it's now growing and now they're adding new brands and what have you. And now we're beginning to think about what our next one is. So what's our next breakthrough product? which we can go into partnership with a big business about because they're not very good at entrepreneurial and we're not very good at managerial and sort of go um, and bring it through. And this, it's, um, it's a really exciting times at the moment. Like I'm, yeah. I'm really excited about human ingenuity and our ability to start going, you know, I, I understand why we've been frozen in the headlights of some of these problems for a while. They're big, they're terrifying, they're like a movie. Climate change is literally like somebody somebody would come up with in a sci-fi movie. It's literally a world-ending problem. And so we're kind of standing and going, ah! And then all the scientists shouting, it's a big problem, it's a big problem, it's a big problem. And then you get all the people going, oh, don't look at it, don't look, don't look up, don't look up, just forget. But then what, what tends to happen is a whole load of people go, that's really interesting. Wow, I wonder if we could do this, or we could do this, or what about if we change this, or we have this? And then human ingenuity. And then the storytellers start going, oh, actually, maybe this is a better story than the one we've currently got. Maybe there's adventure and unexpected allies. Maybe there's characters where maybe there's emotions we can draw out. Maybe this actually is kind of really exciting story to tell rather than a scary story to tell. And that's when you begin to get change. Mm, no, absolutely. And and what's interesting is that it's it's it, it has solutionists, which is your lovely phrase, but people who see this problem think, well, what can I do about it? I'm not just going to sit back and let this happen. Um, they have been in action for decades, right? And it's it's sort of it's whether or not we can um, broaden and get to critical mass. Because what I what I find sometimes quite frustrating is that the poor the poor you know young kids of today they're quite rightly really not happy, right? They, you know, lots of things have conspired to make them unhappy. Not least sitting in their rooms consuming social media. But we we can go perhaps do that leave that for another time. But but the the, the overall sense that my life is not going to be as good as my parents it must be like that must be quite unique and so they've got all of these stresses but what i really want them to understand is that the adults haven't completely failed you like there there have been enough innovations and enough people who were stimulated into the solutionist mindset decades ago that we are now just at the cusp of those kind of potential s curve technology you know take up curves that will mean that we can get off this addiction that we have for for our current energy system and move into the new one. And it, it it's it's we've not done it fast enough for sure. But it, but it ha no one it's not that anyone's you know it's not been completely ignored. Enough people have made made moves and are are now speeding up. I was very. I had to deal with my own ego. I got invited by a group of the young uh, climate activists to um, come and work with them as an elder. <laughs> Not 50, but there you go. <laughs> as an elder to get to, as, as one of these people who've been in sustainability for a long time to learn about mental resilience, how to stay optimistic. They didn't want to know any of my social, any of my solutions in terms of how society could change or technology, what have you. They wanted to know actually how do you keep going? 
how do you keep going in this? Um, and we had a wonderful, wonderful conversation. And what we talked about was solutionists all through, se- there's been solutions for centuries, not just for decades. There have been solutionists in every single um, generation, and there's been solutions in my generation, Gen X. There's wonderful solutionists from the boomers, like with a lot of things about boomers, but actually many of my teachers, many of many of the people who first inspired me into sustainability are, are, are boomers um, and, and, in, and in the generations before. Um, what we need is there to be more solutionists in the coming generations than there haven't been, or even better for being a solutionist just to be normal, to being part of the solution, just being actually what, what you've got. And yes, we have got really, really challenging a um, couple of decades ahead and the communities like the communities that I came from are going to be some of the ones that that are in danger of struggling with it the most unless we're smart and actually realize that solutions can come from and led by and owned by and benefited by within those communities and I think you're beginning to see some of that happening and uh, again it all comes down to changing the story like is this a Frankenstein story Man makes monster and then monster destroys man. It's a very old story, that is. It's actually sort of almost a morality play. There's a almost satisfaction, a narrative necessity in the fact of we've done this terrible thing to the planet because we're selfish and bad and now we're all going to die because of it. And that's what you see most of the movies about climate change are, sort of almost this narrative satisfaction of we get what's coming to us. We have to interrupt that story. We've got, actually got to put it into being an adventure story, being a sort of, you know, I always think of kind of like Lord of the Rings when um, Sam why it says um, nobody would choose to live in a story like this um, but I love reading them and so actually you know we've been chosen we are living in the most important era ever in human history probably sort of equivalent to that period when human beings start, first started using fire that you mentioned earlier this is the most important period of time in human history this is where we are going to get through this barrier or not and to try to reframe that as something incredibly exciting and something where there's there's there really is some major major payback coming at the end of that road if we can go down there is something I'd like to change change the story to yeah and, and also the other thing I think perhaps um, we haven't lost the last two decades because the last two decades has built communications infrastructure that we can absolutely now use to tell the stories in ways that was not possible 20 years ago so so uh, yeah I'm not to be too Pollyanna about it but I mean I, I think I think the harder part for me though is that we are going to have to go through this um, divorce with the current energy system that sustains our life right and it's it's really hard it's you know as was witnessed in COP that the resources are not on our on the side of change. The resources are on the side of holding on to the status quo, and uh, it, that power and influence and money has been a drag. Let's be honest. It, you know, it, this this could have happened in the seventies, but advertising actually it, it, there is this correlation of this this merchants of doubt narrative that I've talked about with Naomi Oreskes on a previous episode. That this this stasis, this staring at the headlights and not knowing what to do isn't an accident actually a lot of it has been seeded so so this role of communications in freeing us from those old stories you know ushering in the new stories i I feel like is super critical to this this destination that you just described 100 percent. but remember that control of the narrative happened during a period of time of very controlled communications you know the Mad Men era, the fact that you could create a roadblock advert where the same advert would go on every TV channel at the same time and on radio. The fact that actually, you know, the the, the what used to be sort of gossip networks and local communications then became monumentally top down, mainly controlled by about four blokes around the world. A couple of movie studio heads and a couple of newspaper heads controlled most of the communication, plus a few ad agencies. That has fractured fundamentally. Now, a lot of people who are over 40 are actually still living within that frame. We still watch the news. We still watch a lot of mainstream media. We still we still are consuming controlled media. But a significant proportion of the rest of the world, particularly the young, are not. And we're sort of like a 15-year-old in her, you know, in her bedroom can create a, a video that outcompetes every brand <laughs> spent. It is much, much, much harder for them to succeed in that, not least because their mindset is all about command and control. Their mindset is all about owning the narrative. Their mindset is all about setting 
shifting the agenda. And those things just don't work in this new narrative world. It's actually a mindset that is destined to fail within these new communication channels. So as you said, they did manage to, they did manage to own the narrative during a period of time of owned media. We're not in that now. Now, I'm not going to say it's automatically means they're going to fail. It definitely, definitely isn't. It just means that we actually have now got the chance for them to fail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I don't think we've quite got over the hill yet because <clears throat> that power, money and influence is now being used in much more elite targeting strategies, you know, making sure that the right elected officials get that into the right places to make decisions or stop stop certain things from happening. So I still think we've got a lot of uh, little skirmishes that we've got to get through. But you're absolutely right to point out that the the, the breaking open of, of narrative and message control is is, is in, in our favour, because as you said, you know, physics and truth is on our side in terms of this is just the reality. And um, and there is now enough uh, knowledge and understanding of what the next phase should and will look like that we can get there. And it, and it just it just means that we have to, tr we, when you get a chink of opening like that, rather than going, oh, yet yeah, the young people are going to get sorted out. They're all going to do the talking. They're going to be on social media. It's all going to be fine. No, it will only work because huge numbers of people get in there and decide to make it the truth. We've got this opportunity. We've got this window that's open to us of where they've lost control of the narrative. We've got to grab it. Um, and that's what they're most afraid of. They're not most afraid of the policy changes. They're not most afraid of the technology changes. They're definitely not afraid of the market. They are afraid of the story. And that's what that's why so much of our effort should be on the story going forward. Well, listen, I'm going to say that this could go on for another hour, I'm sure. But I, and, and we have talked about your book. Uh, so The Solutionist is available in all good bookstores and online and everywhere else. Um, I, it, it's a wonderful book, even if you're deep into this topic or if you're new to it, because it's uh, it's just introduces so many lovely ways of thinking about problems and, and, and harnessing your inner solutionist. So thank you for taking the time to pen that for us. Um, it's been a real pleasure, Sally, catching up, and uh, I look forward to the next time when we meet in person. Definitely, and Brony, thank you so very much. It's a real pleasure, and, and I hope everyone listening has enjoyed it too. Great. Thank you. Speak soon. So that was Solitaire Townsend, co-founder and chief solutionist at Futera. As always, we'll put relevant links in the show notes, including Solly's recent book, The Solutionists, her TED talk about the power and responsibilities of the persuasion industry, the Game Changers movie, and of course, where you can buy Love Bug cat food. You'll also find a link to episode 141 with Naomi Oreskes, lifting the curtain on climate change denial. If you've enjoyed today's conversation, please remember to like, share and subscribe to Cleaning Up or leave us a review on your chosen podcast platform. And do please, please spread the word on social media or by telling your friends and colleagues. And if you want more from Cleaning Up, sign up for our free newsletter at cleaningup.live, where you'll find our archive of over 160 hours of conversations with extraordinary climate leaders. Cleaning Up is brought to you by our lead supporter, Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, and the Gillardini Foundation.